Okay, so welcome everyone and thanks for tuning in um, to one of our um, GQFI Potsdam in collaboration with Warsaw uh, online seminars. Today we're very happy to have Nabil Iqbal from Durham who's going to tell us about towards a 3D Ising model with a weekly coupled string draw. So Nabil, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Ignacio. And, uh, and thank you to this collaboration for giving me the chance to talk about my work. So the title of my talk is Toward a 3D Ising Model with a Weekly Coupled String Dual. And this is some work that I did in collaboration with John McGreevy. Um, and the paper has come out already about a month and a half ago. So before I start, let me just say, um, this is actually my first time giving one of these Zoom seminars. I've been lecturing online for a little bit for my course, but I haven't given a Zoom seminar before. Let's see how it goes. Uh, I wanna encourage everyone to please um, ask questions along the way. Uh, to me, it currently feels like I'm just talking into my computer. So any pushback would be great. So please, uh, please feel free. Okay, so um, let's get started. So what is this talk going to be about? This talk is about a couple of different ideas. Um, so let me give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to begin with a motivation. And this motivation is going to tell you how John and I started thinking about this problem. It's going to touch on some ideas in symmetry and topological phases. And it's really more of a sort of inspiration for the, the tools that we're going to use to think about this problem. I'm then going to spend a little bit of time talking about the 3D Ising model and how you can try to think about it as a string theory. Um, I will highlight what I see as a problem with the, the sort of, this is a subject with a, a long history, but there are some issues with the, the old way of thinking about it. And I'm going to describe our attempts to improve on those issues. Okay. And um, after that, I'll discuss along the way, I'll introduce a slightly modified version of the Ising model. I'll then talk about the phase diagram of that modified Ising model using a variety of different tools. And finally, at the end, I will speculate a little bit on how a world sheet description of the 3D Ising transition might look like. Okay? And so this is a combination of lots of different things. It involves um, some inspiration coming from condensed matter theory and, and quantum field theory. Um, in principle, it involves string theory. In practice, it seems to involve a lot more just sort of statistical physics and lattice physics. And um, along the way, you'll see it also involves some arts and crafts. And I'll explain what I mean by that as I go along. But okay, let's get started. I'm going to begin with the motivation. Okay. So let me start in a sort of very, very general way. Our understanding of the phases of matter is based on symmetry. Okay. So in particular, symmetry is, um, is a very important thing. And uh, the way in which we classify all the different ways in which matter can be organized really has to do with symmetry. So to orient ourselves, let's start by thinking about, for example, the 2D Ising model, okay? So what is the 2D Ising model? Um, so what, the way this works is you have a bunch of spins on a lattice. So here, each of my spins can take the value either plus or minus one. The spin can be either pointing up or pointing down. And this I here runs over all the sites of a 2D lattice. The Hamiltonian of the 2D Ising model looks like this. This sum over angle bracket ij says sum over all of the bonds connecting two neighboring spins. And what this means is every time the two spins across a bond disagree, that costs energy. Okay, that is what that means. So, um, for example, if we were evaluating the Hamiltonian on this spin configuration, I would sum over this bond and these two spins agree, and that does not cost as much energy as when the two spins disagree. So this is a very conventional system. Everyone probably knows about this model already. It's clear that this model has a Z2 global symmetry because if I flip all the spins together, the Hamiltonian is invariant. Okay. okay, now what are the phases of this model? So at finite temperature, this model has two phases. First of all, you can imagine we are at very, very low temperatures. In that case, the system really just wants to minimize its energy. Because it costs energy to have spins disagree, the system is going to want to have all of its spins lined up in the same configuration. So in other words, if one of them is up, they're going to all want to be up. Okay. This is the phase that's usually called the ferromagnet. All the spins are aligned. And an important point is that the symmetry here is spontaneously broken, right? Because all of the spins are pointing up, and they're not pointing down. 
So the fancy way to say that is that there is long range order in the system. This spin is very correlated with this spin because they both know that they're up. Okay. And the way in which you only diagnose this is we look at the two point function of the spin spin operator. If you separate, look at, for example, here, I and J label sites of the lattice. If you separate these by a large distance, then eventually this two point function factorizes into a product of one point functions. And this one point function has a VEV because the spins are all pointing up. And so in other words, the two point function saturates at some non-zero value. That is the two point function of a charged operator. So it's non-trivial that it saturates at some non-zero value. This is called long range order and is a manifestation of a spontaneously broken symmetry. Okay, okay. and imagine you crank this up, all right? And you start to heat it up more. What's going to happen is now some of the spins are going to want to flip because you're heating it up and they, they want to do their thing. Eventually, it turns out that entropy wins over energetics and the system enters a disordered phase. Okay, so this looks kind of more like this. The spins are doing their thing. They're flipping around. And what this means is that now the symmetry is unbroken in this other phase. This is called the paramagnetic phase and the symmetry is unbroken. Uh, you know, you can look at this configuration and you can't maybe obviously tell whether the symmetry is broken or not. That's what it means for symmetry to be unbroken. And a way to diagnose this again is to look at the same two point function of the spins. Here you see this spin is not very correlated with a spin a little bit away because of all the disorder in the system. And if you compute this two point function, what you find is that the spin, spin correlator decays exponentially at large separation. In particular, it decays to zero, unlike the case above. So the main point I want to stress on here is that what you're doing is you are using the realization of the symmetry to distinguish the two different phases. You find an operator that is charged and you compute its two point function and it has a very different long distance behavior in these two phases. The symmetry is what distinguishes the phases of the model. Okay. okay. So everything I've said here is I think very standard. Let's now imagine that we care about what's happening precisely at the critical point between these two phases. Nabil? Yes. We have a question online. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Yes, Is please. That... Yeah, thank you. Question. Uh, hi, uh, so maybe this is a very stupid question. When you say that you have an operator that is charged, what exactly do you mean? Oh, excellent, good. That's a not a stupid question at all. Um, so when I charged, what I really mean is it has a well-defined transformation law under the symmetry. So for example, here you can see that the symmetry flips the spin, right? That's right. what I mean. I, I'd say, I would say formally, the spin is charged under the Z2 symmetry. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Yeah. That's what I mean by charged. Yeah. Excellent question. Normally we use the word charge for continuous symmetries, but it works here as well. Good. Um, any other questions before I go? Okay, great, um, excellent. So now, um, now imagine you care about going close to the phase transition. Close to the phase transition, what happens is you see these correlations happen over larger and larger length scales. And it turns out you can use a continuum theory to describe physics close to the phase transition. So how do you build that theory? Well, what you do is you take these discrete spins and you sort of coarse grain them in some manner to get a coarse grained field, which I'm gonna call phi, okay? I'm not going to go in detail about how this coarse graining works. You can look in textbooks. But the idea is you get a continuous field phi, which continuously depends on space, which is now a continuous parameter because I'm zooming out from the lattice. Okay. An important point here is that this coarse grain field inherits the symmetry property of the spin. So you should imagine that the same Z2 symmetry acts by flipping the sign of the field phi. And now what you do is you try to write down a theory that describes the dynamics of this order parameter field phi. So the way to do this is just start writing down a theory and write down all the terms that are consistent with the symmetry. So for example, d phi squared, okay, that's fine. m squared phi squared is fine. Phi cubed would not be fine because that would break this symmetry. Phi to the fourth is fine and so on and so forth. And then you can study physics close to the phase transition by this continuum field theory, okay? So roughly speaking, the way that these two phases work, you can see in this, in this picture here, we have some potential V of phi. If the mass here is positive, the potential is gonna look kinda like this, and phi is gonna settle down to its bottom of this potential. And what that means is the VEV of phi is zero, and the symmetry is unbroken. This is the paramagnetic phase. 
On the other hand, if the sine of m squared is negative, then this field theory potential looks like this. And now phi is going to settle down to the bottom of this potential. And now the of phi is not zero, and therefore the symmetry is spontaneously broken. This is the ordered or ferromagnetic phase. As you can see, tuning m squared from positive to negative takes us through the phase transition. At the critical point where m squared equals zero, where really by m squared equals zero, I mean you are tuning the relevant deformation that takes you through the phase transition to zero, we have a conformal field theory, a scale invariant field theory describing the transition. Okay? And again, everything that I'm saying here is, I think, uh, very well known to everyone. This is standard stuff. Okay. So the words that I have just said, okay, these last two slides, are really sort of the, the definition or the idea behind the Landau paradigm. So here's Landau, and the way he taught us to think about, you know, the phases of matter, sort of the following uh, two-step process. Number one, the way to think about phases of matter is to classify them by patterns of broken and unbroken symmetry. Okay. For example, this magnet had some sort of a spin-flip symmetry, and by thinking about how the symmetry was realized, we can understand the paramagnetic and the ferromagnetic phase. If you think about the phases of matter that you know and love, this is happening in all of them. Like, for example, when we're children, we learn about solids, liquids, and gases. You know, what is a solid? A solid is something that spontaneously breaks translational symmetry. What is a liquid? A liquid is something where that's not true anymore. This transitional symmetry is no longer spontaneously broken. What is a gas and how is it different from a liquid? You know, it turns out there is no universal distinction between the two of them. You can continuously connect them in the phase diagram. Okay. So the way to think about phases of matter is to think about patterns of broken and unbroken symmetry. Then there's another thing. The critical points between phases can often be understood by universal theories describing the order parameter fluctuations. This is what I described here. Independent of your lattice model that you start with, if you have a Z2 symmetry, at the phase transition, you're going to end up with pretty much the same critical theory. The critical theory has more power than the underlying lattice model. So these two ideas form Landau's paradigm, okay? And this works spectacularly well for many phases of matter. And indeed, this is basically the foundation of sort of textbook condensed matter physics, okay? If you open up any textbook condensed matter physics, it'll eventually get around to explaining these ideas. Okay. Of course, whenever anyone says anything like that, they always say, of course, however, however, of course, much modern work, much of the fun current research in theoretical kinetic matter physics, just kinetic matter physics in general, involves phases and transitions that do not fit into this paradigm. Okay. So for example, topological order. It turns out there are many phases of matter that are not distinguished by local order parameters. Everything I said previously, you could look at the spin operator or some sort of local order parameter to distinguish different phases, but there are phases of matter that are not so, uh, do not behave in this way. An example of these are topological phases of matter. For example, the fractional quantum Hall states are things that exist in real life that are not distinguished uh, by a local order parameter. I'm gonna distinguish those things in, in this talk. It turns out if you Google topological order on Google images, for some reason, this pretzel picture comes up. I'm not really sure why. I think it's because the legs of the pretzel are winding around each other. But in this talk, this pretzel is going to indicate topological order. And uh, deconfined phases of lattice gauge theory are another simple example of topological order. Okay, that's one example. There are, there are many other examples. Um, I'm just gonna say a few that I think are particularly fun. Uh, something called deconfined quantum criticality that is a phase transition between two different phases that have local order parameters, but that you break a sort of different symmetries on either side in some correlated way. Uh, Non-Fermi liquids um, also are different phases of matter that don't obviously, are not obviously classified by symmetries and so on and so forth. And if you're interested, please ask me after the talk. I can talk about this for a while. But in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on topological order. Okay. This is sort of given as the archetypical example of something that does not fit into the normal Landau paradigm. So you should ask, can we do better? Can we, do, can we, can we understand this in some new unified framework? And of course, I'm going to argue that, um, that we can. So to do that, let me just take a step back and just say a few more words about global symmetries. Okay. So what is the point of a global symmetry? So the simplest global symmetry is probably a U1 global symmetry. 
And a U1 global symmetry has a very simple physical interpretation. If you have a U1 global symmetry, then you have a conserved charge current. So you have something like d mu j mu equals to zero. And using that charge current, you can build a conserved charge. Okay. This conserved charge, formally you build in the following way. In form language, d mu j mu equals zero means that d star j equals to zero. So what you do is you integrate star j over a co-dimension one manifold to get some object, which is called q. Q in this formal language is defined on a co-dimension one manifold. And um, the charge operator defined in this way is topological, by which I mean it is independent of this choice of manifold. Now, this is fancy language, but it's something everyone is very familiar with. The way to think about this is take your current and integrate its time component over a constant time slice. Then you get a number, which is the number of particles in your system, and now move that, that manifold upwards in time. Okay? And uh, the charge doesn't change because the charge is conserved. So another way to think about it is this picture. Here are some particle world lines. As I move this, this charge operator upwards in time, the particle number does not change, okay? So therefore, a, a normal U1 symmetry says that you have a conserved particle number, and everyone knows this. Now, this is a continuous symmetry. In this talk, I often care about discrete symmetries. So for example, if you have a ZK symmetry, what it means is that the particle number is conserved modulo K, okay? If you have Z3, then three particles can combine and give you no particles but the particle number is still conserved mod k. Okay, so this is what normal symmetry does for you. But you know, if you look at examples of topological order, they often seem to involve not particles, but sort of higher dimensional objects like flux tubes and things like that. So given this, you might ask, if I have a symmetry principle that conserves particle number, is there a different symmetry principle that conserves the number, the density, not of particles, but of higher dimensional objects. It turns out that there is, okay? So the symmetry principle behind this is called a uh, higher form symmetry or generalized global symmetries. And they're kind of a, a new theoretical idea which were explained in this very nice paper by Gairo, Kapust, and Cyborg, and Willett in 2014. But it's really a very, very simple idea. A higher form symmetry says that what you should do is you can imagine the conservation of higher dimensional objects like strings just by imagining a current that has one more index. Okay. So where previously I had a current with one index, I want you now to think about a current with two indices like this J mu nu here. This is a, these indices are anti-symmetric. So this is a form. And this divergence being zero means that you can construct a, um, a charge operator in the same way by integrating star j over now a co-dimension two manifold, not a co-dimension one manifold. So what does this mean? Well, let's imagine you have a theory with a conserved number of strings. So for example, imagine you're all looking at your computer screen. Imagine there's a bunch of strings coming out of the computer screen pointing towards you, okay? And say you wanna count the number of strings. Well, how do you do it? If you want to count them, all you have to do is integrate over your screen because every string is going to poke through the screen. And that is why you integrate over a co-dimension two manifold, so a surface, rather than a co-dimension one manifold, so a volume, okay? And now you can move that co-dimension two manifold towards you in space or upwards in time and you get the same number. That tells you that string number is conserved, okay? And again, this is for a U1 string symmetry you might have a ZK higher form symmetry. In that case, you'll get a conserved string number modulo K. So this is a very simple idea. And um, this might sound unfamiliar if you've not seen this before, but the truth is they exist in many very ordinary systems. For example, normal 4D Maxwell electrodynamics has such a symmetry. It is associated with the fact that magnetic flux is conserved. And this symmetry, these symmetries, they, they do everything that normal symmetries do, okay? For example, there's a Goldstone theorem for them. They can spontaneously break. You can have a Goldstone theorem. They can have anomalies. You can do hydrodynamics with them. Uh, I myself have had a great deal of fun trying to reformulate magnetohydrodynamics in terms of these symmetries. So this is a new simple idea, okay, that you can now think about. But now there's sort of a very natural question, which is the following. What you are now tempted to do is define a new Landau paradigm. 
Because the old Landau paradigm involves only sort of ordinary symmetries that involve conserved particle number, now that I have these higher form symmetries, you might want to define the Landau paradigm using these, okay? Same as the old one, it just allows for these higher form symmetries, and it suggests that you should classify symmetry, classify phases of matter by asking whether or not these theories, these symmetries are broken or unbroken, okay? So it turns out this actually works. So for example, many of the phases that you would call topological phases of matter are those that have spontaneously broken higher form symmetries, okay? Just like the normal, the normal spin correlators would distinguish a spontaneously a paramagnetic phase from a ferromagnetic phase, a spontaneously broken higher form symmetry can distinguish a topological phase from a trivial phase. But now you should think about the second point in Landau's paradigm. The critical points between phases can be studied by universal theories of the order parameter. In this case, the order parameter doesn't involve condensation of particles anymore. It involves sort of condensation of stringy like things, okay? So this suggests that condensation of strings is a useful thing to think about. That is what Landau would have wanted us to do if we're trying to use his paradigm to understand uh, new phases of matter, okay? Okay, so that's fine. But now, um, let me talk about a very simple example. The simplest example, perhaps, of a topological phase is pure Z2 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions. This theory spontaneously breaks a higher form symmetry in its deconfined phase. But the transition between the trivial phase and the topological phase is in the usual 3D Ising universality class, okay? This is a well-known fact. I'm not gonna, because you don't really need it to understand what I'm gonna say, but I think many of you might have heard of this already. And if you haven't, don't worry about it much. It's not gonna be needed to follow the rest of the talk. But the point is that if you follow this line of reasoning that I've given, what this suggests is that the 3D Ising model should be described or should describe the condensation of strings, okay? So this was the line of reasoning that led us to this, this way of thinking. As I'll explain, this idea has been had by many, many other people over the years, not just us, um, but this is the line of reasoning that we followed. Okay, so let me just pause for a second and ask, are there any questions at this point before I move on? Okay, very good. So um, let me then proceed. Um, this line of reasoning suggests the 3D Ising model describes the condensation of strings. Okay, so now let me tell you, after that rather lengthy motivation, let me now tell you how to think about the 3D Ising model as a string theory. So this idea has a very, very long history, okay? And uh, much of this has rather different motivations, okay? So, um, so this is just a, a subset of the papers that discuss this. I think that it first started in the 80s and many people studied it over the years. You'll notice that um, I think the last paper we could find on this was 1994. Since then, um, uh, I think not much has been done on this. So we're gonna now present our take on it. So let's consider the 3D Ising model on the cubic lattice, okay? So here's a cubic lattice, okay? The 3D Ising model is described the same way as the 2D Ising model. You have I, which runs over sites of a 3D lattice, and you sum over all the bonds in that 3D lattice, okay? So here's a picture of a 3D lattice. Um, here, each of, these, each of these little blobs represents a site that has a spin up, and where there's no spin up, where the spins are down, I have just not drawn a blob for you, okay? So you sum over all of the bonds on this 3D lattice, and just like in the 2D model, every time the spins disagree, that costs energy, okay? And that is the definition of the 3D Ising model. Now, um, an interesting thing is that every time you have a spin configuration, that defines a pattern of domain walls on the lattice, okay? So the way you think about this is, if you have a bunch of up spins, surround them by a domain wall, which separates them from the down spins, okay? So what that means is whenever two spins that are neighboring disagree, that means that there is a domain wall sitting there on the dual lattice separating the two spins. So if that is happening, then what is happening is that this Hamiltonian here is just counting the area of all of these domain walls, okay? 
So for example, here I have a spin up and it's next to another spin, which is also up. There's no domain wall between them. So the Hamiltonian does not receive a contribution from there. But here I have a spin up next to a spin down. So I have a domain wall between them. And now the Hamiltonian picks up one from that, that difference, okay? So up to an overall constant, what this Hamiltonian is just doing is it is measuring the area of all of the domain walls on this, uh, on this lattice. So the Ising Hamiltonian just counts the area of all the domain walls, okay? Okay, this is an important point, so I'll pause again. Are there any questions at this point from anyone? I realize I cannot see the chat anymore, um, but... Oh, there doesn't seem to be any question in the chat either. Okay, great, thank okay. you, Ignaz. Okay, very good. So, um, so this is what the Ising Hamiltonian is doing for you. So now, um, you know, is this a string theory? So, you know, it kind of feels like one, right? Because these domain walls are two dimensional objects and the Hamiltonian just measures the area of all of the domain walls. So in other words, the partition function is just the sum over all possible spin configurations times the exponential of the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian just measures the area. So if you imagine that this H is measuring the area, it's kind of like the Nambu-Goto action, right? Because the Nambu-Goto action just measures the area of all of these domain walls. But there's one big difference between this action and the way in which you normally think about string theory. And when we do string theory, we usually take the Nambu-Goto action and we add a term involving the curvature, the Ricci scalar on the world sheet. And what that does is that introduces a dependence on the genus of the world sheet. There is no dependence on the genus here, okay? In other words, this says sum over all possible configurations of domain walls, but weighted only by the area and not by the genus. But this is not how we do normal string theory. When we do normal string theory, it is really important that we have a genus expansion. In particular, we want to suppress higher genus world sheets because that's important for doing string theory, string perturbation theory. We do string perturbation theory normally by introducing a factor called the string coupling, and the string coupling suppresses higher genus world sheets, and that way we can focus on the spherical world sheets and stay on quantitative. Because this does not have that suppression, this is a lot like having a strongly coupled string theory where G string is exactly equal to one. Now, I've put an absolute value here. This is because I'm sweeping under the rug many interesting details here. In particular, there's a sense in which the string coupling should really be minus one and, and not one. I refer you to Distler's very nice paper for further discussion about that, but it's not gonna be very important for the sort of coarser things that we're gonna say, okay? But basically, the 3D Ising model is a lot like a string theory in that it cares about areas of domain walls, but it's not a string theory that we know and love because the string coupling is one. If you have a string theory, string coupling one, you know, is it really a string theory at all, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this and other reasons is why the program of trying to solve the 3D Ising model using string theory is hard, okay? So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna discuss how to improve on this situation a little bit by giving this model, by changing this model and giving it a new parameter. In addition to the string tension, which is beta, I'm going to also give it a tunable string coupling, which is G string. And now this sum is going to be a sum over all configurations weighted by their Euler character. So in particular spheres will now be more important than tori, which will be more important than higher genus Riemann surfaces and so on and so forth, at least a strong string coupling, at least a small string coupling, sorry. And I'm also gonna tell you how you can tune the string coupling, okay? So this is the goal for the rest of the talk. Um, any questions about the motivation and the goal before I get into the guts of it? Hey, Nabil. Yes. Can you, uh, this is Aninda here. Oh, I, I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, so uh, how is the situation different in two dimensions? And there was this uh, story that Polyakov had developed where he mapped the two-dimensional Ising model to a fermionic string theory. Oh, very uh, good, very good. Um, so, okay, let's think about it. Two-dimensional Ising model is actually not, I would say not a fermionic string theory, but just fermions. Yes. Because That's in two dimensions, you have um, the boundaries between spins are lines and not surfaces. And so then you can think about those lines as the world lines traced out by fermions. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this works perfectly. Like, this is the reason why 
the 2D Ising model is described at criticality by a single Majorana fermion. So that just, that just works, I would say. Okay. And uh, is there a notion of uh, area there? I mean, there, there is no notion of area there. There, there seems to be no, some... It's one... not area. This is, instead of area, this now is, is the length of the world line. Okay, it's the length. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so you can think about that as the world line expansion of the fermion field theory. Okay, thank you. And because we understand how to do that really well, everything just works out great. And so that's, that's what works better. Thank you. Excellent question. Very good. Um, any other questions before I move on? Can I ask uh, another one, please? Uh, yeah. For this string theory, do you know what's the central charge? The, the truth is we are uh, really far from that. Um, so it's basically, as I'm going to argue, it, it's not really going to, to work out great. There's been a lot written about this, but um, it, it's rather difficult to get this to... Actually, can I just defer that question till the end where I'll say a few more words about the world sheet? Is that all right? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, very good. So good. So um, this is an excellent question. And truth is, in the back of our mind, we have the world sheet in the back of our mind, but I'm going to stick to the lattice. To, the things that I'm going to say that are going to be correct are going to be about the lattice. And uh, towards the end, I'll say things that are maybe less obviously correct, which will involve the world sheet. So let me defer your question till there. Okay, excellent. Okay, so what I'm going to do for now is just try to modify the lattice to get a factor of, of chi appearing here. Okay. Okay, let's try to do this. So what I want to do is I want to modify the Hamiltonian to give this theory a string coupling that weights each configuration not only by the area, but also by this Euler character. Okay. So it turns out this is possible to do just by modifying the Ising Hamiltonian. And the reason why this is possible is because the Euler character is a topological invariant, but it has a local representation in terms of a sum over the faces minus the edges plus the vertices of the configuration of domain walls. So what I have to do is figure out a way to extract all of this data from the spin configuration. Okay. So it turns out it's helpful to define the wall operator. So what is the wall operator? The wall operator is an operator defined on each face of the dual lattice, which means it's defined on a bond of the original lattice. And what it does is it gives you a one if there's a domain wall there, and it gives you a zero if not. This is the wall operator in terms of the spins. It's a very simple thing. You can see that if the spins disagree, you get one. If the spins agree, you get zero. Okay. So using this wall operator, it's very easy to, to count the number of faces in the model. That's exactly what the usual Ising Hamiltonian does. The using, usual Ising Hamiltonian just measures the area of all these domain walls, so it counts the number of faces. Okay. So if I sum the number, this wall operator, over all of these faces, I, oh, sorry, over all, every plaquette of the dual lattice, or every bond of the original lattice, I get the number of faces, okay? Okay, done, faces is done. Okay, next up, edges. Okay, so edges is a little bit harder, but only slightly, okay? So let's think of what we're trying to do here. The point is that every edge on the dual lattice might or might not take part in a few domain walls. What we're trying to do is count, excuse me, the number of domain walls that the edge is taking part in. Okay. And it's important that we count. So for example, here, I have no domain walls. So I should have the fact that this is taking part in nothing. So I should get zero. Okay. And uh, sorry, I should say that the, I'm going to denote the number of domain walls that the edge is taking part in with D sub E. Okay. So D sub E in this case where I have no domain walls at the edge is zero. And now you can have a bunch of different combinations. The domain walls are always closed. So it turns out these are the eight possible, com possible configurations I can have. So it's clear that here I have one domain wall taking part in this edge. Here I have one, here I have one, so on and so forth. Here on the other hand, I have two domain walls taking part with the edge. I should count this twice, okay? Because this is really contributing to two different things it should count as two in the Euler character sum. So now I want to extract this from the spin data. And it turns out it's again, sort of straightforward to do this. What you do is you write a projector onto each of these configurations. So for example, if I want to project onto this configuration here, what I do is I write a wall operator on this wall, which is labeled one. I write another wall operator on this wall, which is labeled two. And then I write one minus the wall operator on four, which sticks out from here, and one minus the wall operator on three, which sticks out from here. 
And now this projector is something which is going to be one for this configuration and zero for all of the rest. OK? And now what I do is I sum this over all the eight possible configurations for an edge weighted by this number d sub e, which runs from 0 to 2. And then I sum that over all the different edges of the lattice. OK? And this is now a local thing. It involves a sort of complicated pattern of spins, but it's a local spin-spin interaction that just exactly counts the number of edges of the domain wall configuration. OK? OK, so this is how I'm going to count the number of edges. Are there any questions about this? Because things will get a little bit hairier in one second. You can see I'm not doing anything very fancy. I'm just projecting onto each of these configurations and then counting it in the right way using the spin operators. OK, good. OK, now um, vertices, um, I need to count the number of vertices as well. This is actually significantly more fun. So previously, I had eight different configurations. Now it turns out I have 128 different configurations. And the game is the following. I want to ask how many domain walls does each vertex participate in? So for example, here's a picture of, two ver of a vertex. This is the sort of thing that can happen. It's clear that this involves two different domain walls that are just kissing at one point, right? So I should count this as two domain walls. The vertex number here is two. OK, so that's obvious. And um, you can make this um, into a, a mathematical uh, algorithm by sort of decomposing each vertex into primitives. A primitive is something that you can't break apart any further. And you know, you can look at these two configurations. It's clear you can't break this apart any further. So this is a primitive. This is a primitive. This is not a primitive. OK? And you can write a little program that uh, goes through all these 128 configurations and, and breaks them apart. And then you run into a fun issue, which is the following. OK, the answer to this is clearly 2. But it turns out there are some vertex configurations that can be decomposed into primitives in multiple ways. So for example, here is a vertex configuration which appears. Notice that it turns out you can break it apart into these two configurations, or you can break it apart into these three configurations. Okay? These are both primitive, and these are all primitive. Okay? Each of these can't be broken apart anymore. So now there's actually a confusion, which is, what do I do? What do I pick? How do I break apart this, this configuration here? This is a problem that we have to solve if we want to assign an Euler character to a domain wall configuration. Which of these two things do we pick? OK, so uh, we thought about this, and we came up with two different ways to solve this problem. Uh, the first option, which we call the no touching protocol, is kind of a sort of lazy way out. What you do is you basically say, these are confusing. I don't want to think about them. And what you do is you write a projector in your Hamiltonian that gives these, all of these problematic configurations a large energy, OK? Thereby forbidding them from appearing dynamically in your problem. Physically, what this means is, you see, this kind of thing happens whenever two world sheets kind of touch at some corner in some specific way. You're just preventing that from happening. It's like giving a sort of repulsion to the world sheets, OK? Not letting them touch each other anymore. So this, has, this, is, this is perfectly fine. You can do this. This has the upside that it's simple. It has the downside that we no longer really have the usual Ising model anymore. It turns out it is in the same universality class, but that's something you should have to check. Another downside is um, we're going to soon simulate this using Monte Carlo methods. And um, this is harder to simulate because many configurations are forbidden. And the way the Monte Carlo methods work, that just technically makes it harder because you have to sort of sample those and those steps are rejected and so on and so forth. So this is sort of aesthetically unpleasing because I feel that this is kind of a cop out. And it's, um, it's just harder to simulate as well. OK, but still, we, we did study this. Okay. There's something which I like a little better, which is called the branch point protocol, which is the following. What you're just saying is, just make a choice. Okay? For each configuration, break it apart into as many primitives as possible while preserving rotational invariance. So in particular, given this configuration, don't do this one. Do this one instead, because 3 is greater than 2. Okay? So we studied both of these protocols. I'm going to focus on the branch point protocol for this talk, just for reasons of time. The results from this other protocol are, are not really very different. Um, but um, I encourage you to look at our paper if you're interested in what happens with this one. 
Okay. So good. So once you make this choice, now what you can do is you can just go through all 128 possibilities. Um, and for each of them, figure out how many to break it apart in. You can make a table of all of them. This is Appendix uh, D of our paper, I think. And uh, for example, configuration number 73 is primitive already. Configuration 76 can be split apart into two. So it has vertex number two and so on and so forth. And then you do what you did for the edges, sum this vertex number over a projector onto that particular vertex configuration, and then sum this operator over all of the vertices. Okay. So this is a complicated pattern of spin-spin interactions, which is still local. It just involves, I think, now next to next to nearest neighbor interactions of the spins. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point before I go on? No. Okay. Let me proceed. So what do we do next? Now, it turns out that uh, we're actually not done yet because we are making a choice on how to reconnect the walls at each vertex. And it is possible for those choices to be incompatible along an edge. Okay. So in other words, I'm encouraging you to think about these choices as the splitting apart of, vert of domain walls at a vertex. So for example, here is a possible configuration which could happen. Imagine I have a vertex here and a vertex here. What these colors are meant to say is that on this side, this blue line means that this wall is connected to this wall. But on this side, coming out from this vertex, this wall is connected instead to this wall here. Okay. And therefore, you see, this is incompatible because the pattern of wall reconnections has changed along the edge. So it turns out that what this does is this introduces a curvature singularity at the edge with total angle of four pi. Okay. And um, this you can take into account in the Euler character. You have to take this into account in the Euler character to get a consistent answer. It contributes to the Euler character by adding an overall minus one as if uh, compared to the case when there was no branch cut here. Okay. And this is why this is called a branch point singularity. This little sphere here, or this is why this is called a branch point model, because this model requires you to take into account these branch point singularities. And again, you can take this into account by just writing a slightly more complicated edge operator. Okay. Now, the words that I've just said are probably extremely confusing. And uh, the way in which we figured this out in practice was we actually made a lot of paper models, the, these configurations. And because I want everyone to share in the fun, here is a fun lockdown activity. Here is a paper cutout that you can use to make your own branch point singularity. So I'll give you a second to take a screenshot. Okay, so what you do is you can cut this out, okay, and then follow these instructions here, all right? And if you do it correctly, what it looks like is this. Um, let me just show you my video for a second. At this point, I believe my video should be the big thing on the screen. Um, and so if you can see this, this is what it should look like. And what's happening is that um, over here, you have a certain pattern of domain walls. And along the other side, you have a different pattern of domain walls. And they're reconnected at one point. And if you trace the angle going through here all the way around, then you can confirm for yourself that the total angle around the branch point is 4 pi. And this is actually, is various ways to understand it, but this is actually how we understood it in practice. OK, okay. let me now go back to the slides. OK. Uh, are the slides back again? Sorry, can everyone see the slides again? Yes, they are. OK, great. So um, after doing all of that, finally, um, we have our model. Our model is now the Hamiltonian for what I'm going to call the 3D Ising string theory. OK. It has two terms in it, basically. This term here is the Euler character of the lattice domain walls. And this term here is the area of the domain walls. This is the ordinary Ising Hamiltonian. Okay. And so the new thing is here, basically we put a new coupling phi multiplying this Euler character term. And this gives our theory both a tunable string tension and a string coupling. Okay. The string coupling is the exponential of the dilaton, like usual. And now each configuration is weighted, as I promised, by a factor of gs to the minus chi. Okay. So I've just given you a Hamiltonian, which uh, I think you can now really think of it as a string theory because it has a string coupling. 
Okay, so this is a complicated Hamiltonian uh, to write down in terms of spin operators, but it's a perfectly fine local thing with a complicated pattern of spin spin, local spin spin interactions. So we can now study this with normal statistical mechanical techniques. Okay, and that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of this talk. I'm gonna now tell you what happens if you study this model. And um, I think this is kind of nice because you can really think of this as a non perturbatively defined string theory on a, on a lattice, okay? So um, in principle, you can ask this various sort of stringy questions you might have. In practice, as I'll explain, um, it's kind of a complicated string theory. So um, it, it's not easy to get answers from it, but you can throw it on a computer and ask it anything you want. Okay, are there any questions about this model before I go on to discuss it a little bit? Yeah, Nabil, can I ask a question? Please, yes. Hello. Um, so in, let's say if you wanted to study the theory in the limit of weak uh, GS. Yeah. Is that, uh, would I be correct to say that that would then be um, um, dominated by spherical, whatever they're called, domain walls? Uh, absolutely, yes. And would that be, in the case of spherical domain walls, does it not, it, it, is it correct also to say that it doesn't matter which protocol you take? or your vertices slash edges or whatever? Uh, that's a very good point. So actually, I'm gonna discuss what happens in weak string coupling. You're right about the spherical domain walls. The truth is the domination by spherical domain walls results in a maybe not uh, in an unintended consequence is that there's a lot of them. It really proliferates them. And the closeness that you can proliferate them depends on the protocol. I'll see. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let me, you. I'll, uh, I'll, maybe on the next slide, I can explain this a little bit more. Um, so let me go on to the next slide um, and answer your question then. If Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I realize I can't quite see, who is this speaking? Um, Kevin, this is Kevin. Oh, hey, Kevin, okay, good, thank you. Okay, good, um, any other questions? Um, okay, very good. So let me move to the next slide where I'll, I'll answer Kevin's question. So, um, so now let me just, now I have a statistical physics model. Let me now just study that using, um, using normal statistical physics techniques, okay? So if someone hands you a model like this, what you should really do is first try to think about it at, mean, at the mean field level. So when I say mean field, what I mean is I'm going to first imagine taking all these couplings, in other words, beta and phi, to be very, very large and positive or very, very large and negative, okay? In that case, what happens is you find an ordered phase by which what I mean is the system is just gonna want to minimize its energy by settling into the configuration that either minimizes the area, if for example, beta is very, very large, corresponding to low temperature, or if you take, go to very, very weak string coupling, what's going to happen is that phi is going to go very, very negative, okay? And what that means is that it's going to want to make chi as big as possible, okay? Which means that it's going to, um, uh, you should find the configuration that results in the largest chi. So if you now assume a two by two by two unit cell, you can just figure out what those configurations are by enumerating all the possibilities. So let me tell you what happens in this phase diagram like this. So at very, very large beta, that's sort of very, very, uh, very, very high string tension, the system wants to have no domain walls at all. And it does that by aligning all of the spins. And so we get the normal ferromagnetic phase and indeed the line with phi equals to zero here is exactly the normal Ising model, so we should get the normal ferromagnetic phase. At large negative beta, it's not clear what that means in string theory, but you get the anti-ferromagnet, okay? It wants to put as many domain walls as possible here. Let's now think about very, very weak string coupling. In other words, phi goes to negative infinity. As Kevin anticipated, what happens there is it wants to dominate the system with spherical domain walls, but what that really means is it wants to fill space with as many spherical domain walls as possible, okay? And you then result in something which we call the packed phase. The packed phase is the answer to the question, how do I fill space with as many spherical domain walls as possible? And the answer is you do it like this, okay? So each of these little cubes is a little sphere, okay? And this is the closest that they can come as permitted by this protocol that we introduced, okay, this branch point regularization. Now, Kevin, answer to your question, if I started instead the no touching protocol, I would get a different, I would, it turns out this particular thing is forbidden by the no touching protocol, because at this point they're touching. So what happens is you do again fill space with spheres, but you fill them with spheres that are a little bit further apart from each other. Instead of three spheres by, per unit cell, I think you get two spheres per unit cell. 
we call it the dilute phase in the paper, but it's, a, it's conceptually the same thing, just the density of spheres is a little bit less because they can't touch, okay? Okay, good. So this is the phase diagram. And finally, at very, very large phi, you get something um, which is basically filling space with a network of tubes that interlink in such a way as to give you a net, a genus which grows with volume. This is something which has been studied before in the soft matter literature. It's called the plumber's nightmare. And lest it haunt your dreams, I have not shown you a picture of it, but um, you can, it's just another pattern of tubes that are interlocking here. Okay, so this is the sort of mean field phase diagram that you get just from minimizing the energy, by which I mean minimizing or maximizing the area or the Euler character. Okay, however, we don't really care that much about the classics. What we really want to understand is what is happening with the onset of the disordered phase. We care about the phase transitions. So what we do here is we actually did Monte Carlo simulations to understand this, okay? As I'm going a little bit slowly, I'm not gonna go into much detail about this Monte Carlo stuff. I'm just gonna tell you, you can do Monte Carlo stuff and it's great fun. And um, we did two different Monte Carlo methods. We use both the single spin updates and the cluster updates. If you know what that is, that's, that's great. And if you don't, it's okay. We just did a bunch of simulations, okay? And you have to figure out order parameters that project, that tell you about these different, these different orders. It turns out that the order parameters you use is dictated by the group, by the group theory of the cubic lattice. You can figure out what's happening there. Um, and um, what you find is that um, uh, you need a bunch of different order parameters. For example, you have one order parameter for ferromagnetic order, a different one for anti-ferromagnetic order, a different one still for the, the sort of packed phase. And you can measure all these order parameters in your simulations. And the phase diagram that you get is this, okay? So here is the actual phase diagram coming out from the simulations. What we did was we scanned through the, the dilaton and the string tension. And um, there's a lot of information here. The way in which we visualize this is we assign to each point in this phase diagram an RGB value where the redness is the strength of ferromagnetic order, the greenness is the strength of ferromagnetic order, and the blueness is a slightly different order parameter that sort of has overlapped with the packed phase. And you can see that you get these four different phases. This phase, though you can't tell, is much more blue than this phase, and this is the plumber's nightmare phase. And I've also drawn the dotted lines for the mean field phase boundaries. You can see that in some phases, it follows the mean field boundary quite quick, quite well. In other parts, it doesn't really follow it very well. But topologically, it's the same as the mean field phase diagram. The black phase here is the disordered phase, okay? Here, all the order parameters are zero, okay? And so the transition that we initially wanted to study is the transition between the ferromagnetic phase and the disordered phase, okay? Just recall, in the ferromagnetic phase, the spins are all lined up. That means there are very few domain walls and the domain walls are tension. So this is kind of the normal stringy phase. This is like the normal string vacuum, if you will, where strings don't really want to form and it costs tension to form them. The disordered phase is the phase where the strings have gone crazy. They wiggled around a lot. The tension was so low, they sort of condensed, whatever that means. In this context, it means that you have a disordered, um, a disordered phase with zero order parameter, okay? And finally, the packed phase, as I just mentioned earlier, is where the dominant thing is not the string tension, but the string coupling. The system really wanted to fill space with spheres, and it filled them with as many spheres as possible. Now, um, the boundary that we really care about is this phase boundary here. This line here, at this point, it was the normal 3D Ising transition. But we're really interested in understanding how that transition changes as you vary the string coupling, okay? The line, this, this phase line, this phase boundary becomes a line here, and you really care about the order of that transition, okay? So how do we figure that out? Well, um, uh, again, I would have loved to go into more detail, but as I'm running a little bit short on time, let me just tell you a few words about how you do this. There's something that you plot, which is a dimensionless combination of, um, of observables. And because it's dimensionless, what you do is you can plot it against a dimensionless combination of the system size and the distance of the, of the relevant operator from the critical point. If you do it right, then as you vary the system size, all of these curves collapse onto one. That happens if you are at a critical point and if you figured out the exponent of the transition correctly. So in practice, what you often do is if you don't know what the exponent is, you tune the parameter appearing in these plots until all of these curves line up, you have found the exponent correctly. So we did, since this plot here is the normal 3 Ising model, 
we know the exponent there. What we did was we varied the string coupling for a couple of different sizes and checked that the data collapse still works for the same value of the exponent. And it does. So what that means is that this line over here remains in the usual 3D Ising class. As we vary the string coupling, we stay in the 3D Ising universality class, okay? At least over here, everywhere along this dotted line. Okay. But now remember, the, the, my hope was that I could understand the string coupling, the, sorry, the 3D Ising transition by going to weak string coupling. It turns out you can't actually tune this transition to arbitrarily small string coupling. And the reason why is that there's this line over here where beta equals to zero. What that means is the bare string tension is zero. You probably don't want to take the bare string tension negative. That doesn't make much sense. And it turns out the transition here saturates at a certain value of the dilaton. It turns out to be negative 0.4. Okay. And what that means is the slowest you can tune the string coupling while still accessing the phase transition is the string coupling is about 0.6 which is not really that much smaller than one. And um, you know, so, so why did this happen? One way which I'd like to interpret this is this really happened because of this new packed phase. What we hadn't anticipated was when you tune the string coupling to zero, you really emphasize the production of spherical string world sheets. That is the dominant thing at very, very weak string coupling. And that sort of takes over from the transition you had been hoping to study, okay? So this new phase gets in the way, okay. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay. Uh, so, um, Ignacio, sorry, how much time do I have left? Um, uh, we're, well, if you want, you can take some five or 10 minutes. Good. Let me take, uh, can I take finish? five minutes? Is that okay? Let me take sure. five minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Okay. So, um, so let me just say a few more things. Um, it turns out you can measure various fun things about the topology of world sheets. There's some curious things here that I'm happy to talk about if you're interested. But let me now instead switch to the final part of my talk, which is speculations about the string world sheet. Okay. So um, having done this uh, statistical physics uh, exercise, um, let me now try to say a few words about what the world sheet theory uh, can look like. So um, this is something which has been studied. I started this talk by advocating that there should be a world sheet theory. Now, what would this theory look like? Now, this has been studied by many people in the past. We are returning to this problem now. And the reason why we think this is, we, now is a good time to do it is because we have a couple of new insights. So for example, nowadays we know about holography and that leads to a sort of obvious point, which is that at the critical point describing the 3D Ising model, the world sheet theory should realize 3D normal invariance. And how do we do that? Well, that suggests that the world sheet sigma model should actually have an ADS4 target space. That's what you might imagine should be happening at the actual critical point. Now, um, it turns out there are some issues with this because this sigma model is not actually conformally invariant on the world sheet, okay? So this, this target space has curvature. And so the sigma, model, um, uh, the sigma model on the world sheet runs, okay? And uh, it's not conformally invariant. So you can't directly use this to do string theory. It turns out there's some evidence that there's a non-trivial small radius fixed point with this target space. And um, if that's the case, that would sort of make sense because there'd be a sort of a very, very stringy ADS4 that maybe is the right thing to describe a sort of strongly coupled uh, field theory with no hierarchies in it. But you know, even if you fix that, this is confusing. And this relates to Nopodal's question. You see, this would have some non-trivial central charge and you don't need to cancel the vial anomaly of that non-trivial central charge. It's not really clear how you would do that. It, to me, it feels conceptually wrong to throw in a couple of extra demands because you'd get probably extra symmetries from that. And um, the sort of usual space like linear dilaton actually doesn't work because what you would try to do is add the extra dimension multiplying the Ricci scalar on the, on the world sheet, but that breaks target space scale invariance. So there is some confusion here. I don't think I really know a very good way to realize the desired symmetries on, of the world sheet. Okay. It turns out there's a less ambitious thing you can do. You could imagine taking the 3D Ising model and just putting a single large string in there and looking at fluctuations of that single large string rather than trying to reproduce everything about the partition sum. So this is the idea behind effective string theory, which was I think nicely initiated by Polchinski and Strominger quite some time ago. What you do is you put a big string in there and allow it to fluctuate. And then you can actually compare this with the lattice. 
It turns out away from criticality, this matches lattice data quite well. For example, um, here's a certain ratio of Wilson lines that they examined from the lattice. Uh, this is a rather blurry plot, I'm sorry. But these dots are the lattice and the line is the theoretical predictions of this effective string theory. You can see it works really well. This is all good away from the critical point. And you can ask what happens as you approach the critical point. So there's a curious thing here, which is that in this picture, the world sheet fields on the string, you can think of as Goldstone modes for broken translations. And at criticality, you would expect there to also be a Goldstone mode for broken scale invariance because the string has some thickness, but all thicknesses are equivalent at criticality. In fact, there's even some evidence on the lattice for a breathing mode, which could be this Goldstone mode. It could become gapless at the critical point, and it could be this Goldstone mode. This is kind of cool because then these two things would sort of have to fit together to give you an emergent ADS4. We should realize the things I said on the previous slide in maybe a more tractable way. Okay, so there are many, many discussions for future research here. Let me just say a few of them. Um, one question is, which I started this discussion with it, is if you think about higher form symmetries and their anomalies, what is the new Landau paradigm? And does it include all possible phases of matter? Um, I didn't talk about this much, but please ask me afterwards. It's quite possible that there are mysteries involving statistical topology, even in the normal 3D Ising model. There are various plots that are zero when they don't need to be. And I like to understand what's happening there. And finally, the, the most optimistic thing, of course, is can string theory help us understand critical phenomena in statistical physics? Or vice versa, can this lattice definition of string theory help us understand questions in string theory? And this is the thing which I'd really like to understand. So um, thank you all for listening. And uh, that is the end. Okay, thank you, Nabil, very much uh, for this great and very clear talk. Um, there's already questions. Uh, so, Deepak. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Nabil. Hey. Uh, actually, I had also had the opportunity of listening to uh, John McGreevy's talk. Okay, great. And uh, not to create any, any uh, tension between the two of you, but I find yours to be by far uh, easier to understand. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, like you can also have uh, sort of like domains which have uh, like a toroidal topology. Yeah. And let's say you could have two, two tor tori and they're intersecting. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So such uh, configurations uh, would not be, uh, would be ignored by the Hamiltonian that you have presented, right? Yeah, that's right. That, that, um, well, okay, so let's think about this carefully. You can have two tori. Now, when we say that they're intersecting, um, the truth is the, the Hamiltonian makes a choice about how to resolve all possible intersections. So, you know, it could happen that they intersect or it could happen that it chooses to break them apart. Like, in, rather than making them intersect, it chooses a resolution where they sort of um, don't touch each other in the end, but they, they resolve to be separated. But um, I can answer to that question, yeah. That's right. When I, what I actually meant is that they're linked, not not that they are. Like oh, linked. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so sorry, was that the question? Yeah, if, if that's possible, that is certainly. No, possible. so those configurations are not not being uh, that linking is not being uh, accounted for in the Hamiltonian. The, good, let's think about this. The Hamiltonian does not know about that linking. So the Hamiltonian right. would see two objects with Euler character uh, zero, with total Euler character zero each. And um, yeah, that's right. And so it would, not, uh, it would not take that into account. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You could imagine a, a more complicated Hamiltonian that would take into account that linking. It's certainly possible. Yeah. Okay. Although I think that might not be local actually at the end of the day. But, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yes. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, Joseph is next. Hey, Mabel. Uh, this is Joe Minahan. Um, I have a, just a, probably a pretty naive question. So normally in the icing model, the ferromagnetic, the ferromagnetic is more or less equivalent to anti-ferromagnetic. You just do a transformation. So yeah. What, what, so presumably uh, when you add this uh, extra term to count that breaks that symmetry. Is that what happened, or 
Oh uh, yeah, that that's correct. Yeah. So the the um so let's take a look at this line. You can see that if you're at phi equals to zero, um, there is no new information at positive beta versus negative beta, because as you said, um, this is there's a symmetry transformation, which is take each spin and take it to, uh, I think minus minus one to the power of x plus y plus z, right. and that takes the that takes beta to minus beta. So there's no new information here. That symmetry is broken by the new coupling. That's right. So that's why you can see if you move away from this on this on this thing, then there's no symmetry in beta and minus beta anymore. So that's correct. Yeah. So in our simulations, we find that the um, just as a check, the Ising transition happens at phi equal to zero and beta equal to plus 0.2 and minus 0.2. You get the same sort of transition, but then these two things move off in different directions uh, as you crank up the string coupling. I see. Uh, so just to follow up, so. Um... Is there something you could add, you know, some modification you could, you know, make that would sort of preserve that at all? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be counting surfaces, I guess. But yeah. Uh, um, so that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think is the, is the simple answer. Um, uh, I'm not sure. It, 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 you know, there, yeah, it would be hard to do that, I feel, because um, it really, that, that trans transition really interchanges the completely, from the surface point of view, that interchanges the, the vacuum with no surfaces with the vacuum that's completely full of surfaces. So right. it would definitely be counting something else, I think. So that, that's, a, that's definitely true. Okay. So right. I don't actually know. So, but let me maybe, because uh, we'll follow up a uh, question to your question. Something that I, I did toy with was, you might try to get sort of self-duality. I try to go for a phi goes to minus phi symmetry so that, you know, this is like G string goes to one over G string. That's mm -hmm. something that's not obviously um, ruled out, I think. So you might hope there's a way to further embellish this model to, to permit that. And uh, okay, I couldn't think of a simple way to do it, but I think it, it might well be possible. I think you have quite a lot of freedom here, actually, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Next in line is uh, Michelle. Oh, remember you have to unmute your microphone to speak up. Um, Michele. Yeah. Oh, Michele. Sorry. Okay. Anyways, we can uh, continue with Deep Tarka. Hi, Navel. Hi, hey, Deep. Yeah. So, uh, very nice talk. So, uh, two questions. One is, uh, can you um, prevent uh, non-orientable surfaces in using? Ooh. Oh, very good. Um, so we, we were confused about this in the past. The truth is this branch point resolution protocol permits non-orientable surfaces. Um, they uh, experimentally, they happen with very few, with very low frequency, but they are there. Um, and um, I, it is possible. I think that the no touching protocol actually forbids them. Uh, I mm. think I should, I can, I can check that, but it, I think that's the case. Seems like you, you may need some new, Plaquette like variable also to um new plaquette like variable. I'm not certain actually that that's the case. Um, like sorry, I, I think I get I see what you're what you're getting at, but I think it. You see, for a while we actually thought that we wouldn't have them ever, just because it, it seemed unlikely. That's not really a good way of thinking about it. But um, this branch point business basically creates something which is hard to visualize, and it cannot always be immersed in a, in a nice way into mm -hmm. um, into three dimensions. But I think the no touching protocol probably just straight up forbids them. Just because we don't let them touch in a way that would, you see what I mean? The no touching protocol doesn't let things intersect itself anymore. I think it may just straight up do that. Um, if that's what you want, yeah. And uh, another quick question. Yeah. So if you did it for say tetrahedron, um, so right, sure. the lattice, will, you, will you expect the same universality class or uh, will, does that also change? Oh, excellent question. So. Um, Good. So I don't expect anything to change if you, I don't expect, so by universality class, I think you mean something like what's happening in the vicinity of the usual Ising transition, right? You're saying that, would you expect that to change? And I think the answer there is no, but all of these ordered phases that you get when you crank up or down the string coupling, those probably will actually look different, is my guess. Um, because this depends a lot on the UV regularization. So like, I think it'll be conceptually similar in that it will try to, like at very low string coupling, it'll want to put a lot of spheres into the system. At very high string coupling, it'll want to create some sort of terrible nightmare. But um, I think that the details of the ordered phases will change quite a bit. 
change is, is my but, guess. But the exponent new will not change. I don't think so. Not in a neighborhood anyway. Like even in this case, new is the same for a while, but eventually some new phase appears. Then of course you have to deal with the new phase. So yeah, indeed, that, that's what I expect to happen. I should say that, you know, we did a lot of, we had to fight really hard because the cubic lattice allows these terrible self intersections. You know, you could have probably started with the cube octahedral lattice to begin with and then not had to do all this branch point stuff. So I think that's maybe something to keep in mind for, for later study. So. Okay, thanks. Next question from Shuvik. Um, so, so at the critical point, I mean, is there a, a simple description of the domain wall configuration as you change the value of the diloton? Uh, so let me understand, you're saying at the critical point, meaning here, and now I take- So along that line, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, along this line, as yeah, I, yeah, as I yeah. alter phi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. Um, I don't actually know. Uh, by, by simple, do you mean like, um, if I look at it, can I? Can yeah, I like the geometric, like a simple geometric. Yeah, if you look at it. But, uh, as, for this excuse, I'm going to take this as an excuse to show the slides that I skipped through. Um, mm -hmm. So like, you see, in principle, we can, it's just, there's a lot of information here. It's hard to really tell what to visualize. We can just do a simulation and you can stare at these pictures. You know, I can send you lots of pictures of cubes, but you might, you know, sort of ask what, what is it like, how do you characterize all this data? Right. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we made a plot of was the average Euler character per cluster. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is basically saying, what is the, you know, the typical cluster, what is its topology? A really interesting thing happens, which is that it's almost always uh, very close to zero, always at the critical point. That's what all these curves crossing zero means. Okay. And so we don't really understand what this means or why this is happening. And um, so, you know, basically this is suggesting that there's a lot of tori at the critical point everywhere along that line. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this is only suggesting that because the truth is, it's actually a very confusing question. And it turns out there's a history of this question being studied before and it doesn't quite work out. And David Hughes studied this a long time ago. I'm happy to talk about this more. But um, in principle, we have pictures like snapshots of, of this, these configurations, but I don't really know what to look for. So if you ask me, you know, you know please make a plot of the average density of Euler, you know, of, of tori, then I can do that for you. But I don't really know how to slice this data. So if you have any ideas, please, please let me know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, right now I don't have any ideas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Next question, uh, Patrick. Hi. Um, Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Hi. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't think you covered this, but I remember that there were some papers by Sedrekian where he was worried also about things called Whitney singularities, where yeah. a sort of intersection line ends at a point. Does this come into your story at all? That, that, so, okay, good. So let me just, for everyone else, let me just say maybe, um, uh, talk about that a little bit. So as I said, there's been a huge amount of work on this. And uh, I think you're talking about uh, Sedak, uh, Sedakian has some paper, I forget from when, about exactly this. You see, I glossed over something that's actually kind of important, which is, I just said sum over the spins. That's the right thing to do. And that's the same as summing over areas. The truth is that that's not really true. The sum over spins isn't obviously a sum over domain walls uh, with the right measure. and the way to correct it is you want to add, if you have a self intersection line at the surface, you want to add um, uh, something which is raised to minus one to the length of the self intersection line. Okay. And then those self intersection lines can end. And uh, indeed, I looked at this paper, you have a peculiar singularity at the intersection of the self intersection, at the end point of the self intersection line. And then uh, Sedakian worried a lot about this. There was a follow-up paper by Distler who actually argued that you can capture the same physics by weighting um, the, the configuration by um, the Euler by minus one raised to the power of the Euler character. And Distler argued that was the same, that was the same idea. And then when, uh, when John McGreevy gave a talk about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sedrakian actually said, no, no, that does not work, uh, despite what it says in the paper. And um, the truth is, I don't actually know what the upshot of that story is. Um, yeah. So there's many things that are happening here. The truth is, my discussion is at kind of a cruder level than that, because I just simply didn't worry about that. I just tried to modify the Hamiltonian to give us a string coupling. I didn't think at all about the fact that the measure coming from the sum over spins is not really the correct measure for string theory. Okay. That would be something that you would definitely want to think about if you wanted to make this work correctly. Yeah. 
So it's a, it's, a, it's one one level above what I studied. But this is actually what I'm. This, this little footnote here is really what I'm, I was trying to sweep under the rug there. But I, I recommend this first paper. It's it's very it's, it's very simple to understand. And okay, apparently it doesn't quite work. But yeah, this is something I was not really aware of. Excellent question. Okay, thanks. Okay, since there uh, doesn't be uh, seem to be one more any question. Um, oh, okay. Hey, uh, so uh, I'm wondering uh, the three uh, D classical IC model that you considered um, is dual or uh, might say equivalent to the two D quantum Ising model. Yeah. Is this uh, still uh, does this still exist in the string theory picture somehow? Or oh, excellent question. So I think what you could do is you could take this Hamiltonian that I wrote down. And, uh, and cut it open and sort of, um, I guess, the inverse of charterizing it. You see, you could interpret this as a quantum theory in two plus one dimensions, right? This, this is some particular pattern of, of, of evolution in time. It's translationally invariant, so you can interpret it as some sort of quantum Hamiltonian. And I think that would be a really fun thing to do because it would really describe like string, you know, you could have strings evolving in real time and merging and doing all their quantum stuff. And you could play with this and see if there's interesting real time quantum dynamics and things like that. So you could totally do that here. It would be a bit painful because of the complexity of this Hamiltonian, but there's no problem in principle with doing that. And I think that would be a very fun thing to do. Yeah. Interesting things. Okay, so if there are no further questions, uh, we thank Nabil again. Okay, thank you very much.